Hey guys, Matt here. So in this next set of videos, we're going to be taking a look at some force analysis, stress analysis, and using this to design sections and select the right material for certain sections given certain forces and stresses going through them. Um, I'm hoping that this is mostly just revision for most people. Um, so stress calculations, looking at putting together uh, shear force diagrams, bending moment diagrams, that sort of thing. Um, so we're going to be going through it pretty quickly in these videos. So first thing we're looking at is force analysis. Um, so this is basically going to be looking at some simply supported beams or cantilever beams as well. Um, and nothing too complicated here. Just going through the basics we have on the left here we have a simply supported beam with a pin and a roller and we have a force applied in the middle uh, we balance the forces to get our reactions at each support so this is just balancing in the uh, y direction uh, for this case it's right in the middle so the reactions are split evenly between the two supports uh, if it wasn't split evenly, uh, we might have to do uh, summer moments around one of the supports where the net moment at the support is zero and then use the distances to calculate uh, what the other reaction is. Uh, so then we have our shear force diagram and bending moment diagram. So shear force diagram, nice and easy, so just straight up with the reaction and the force in the middle comes down here and then re the reaction at the other end there so sum of forces comes to zero. Bending moment diagram we have down the bottom here so at the pins with these roller joints we have net moment is zero at those supports so the maximum moment is right in the center of the beam. Um, to get this this is coming from the shear force diagram. We have the area here gives us how high we should be coming here on our bending moment diagram. Uh, very similar here on the right hand side except we've gone with a, a uniformly distributed load. So getting the reactions uh, is very similar so you could convert that to a point load in the middle to get your reactions and then the shear force diagram is the main difference is because it's a uniformly distributed load it becomes a linear slope going from one end to the other and that means then when you integrate down to your bending moment diagram uh, we get a parabola curve and this value here is still just the area of one of these triangles here. Uh, the other thing we've got to consider is uh, simple cantilever beams. So I've got a few examples here. Uh, first easiest one we just have a force at the end of our beam here. Uh, to balance this we need to balance um, the X forces which there are none in this case but we might have a few cases where there's some X forces to be ba balanced. Uh, we also then have to balance our Y force so that's how we get this F here and then in this at the wall we also have a reacting um, bending moment so that's the difference between these and the simply supported beams. Um, so our shear force diagram we have our forces, so first force this F coming up to F and then come across then back down to zero so the sum is zero. And our bending moment diagram we have zero bending moment at the end of the cantilever beam and then our maximum bending moment is at the wall. Um, so we could also just add in a few more forces, nothing really changes here, um, it's just our bending moment then slopes a bit or if we have a uniformly distributed load on there uh, we get a parabola curve once again. 
Uh, just a couple of things to remember when creating these diagrams, doing any force analysis is first is some forces in the x and y direction so they equal zero and to take a net moment around a pin joint is zero newton meters so uh, this will come in handy when doing any simply supported beams. Okay moving along from simple force analysis the next thing we have to look at is different failure conditions so what are the different modes of structural failure we might encounter and just a note here is the modes we consider here we take individually so we're not compounding them um, this is a pretty big simplification so uh, there's no von Mises equivalent stresses or anything that we have to think about right now but definitely later on in your degree that's what you're going to have to start looking at some references for this uh, is your Mechanics and Materials book uh, by Hibbler and the book that will that you'll be needing for Design 2 which is Fundamentals of Machine Component Design uh, so they're the books where I pulled a little bit of stuff from for this um, as well as just the internet you can get on say sites like Engineering Toolbox that's got a few good references as well on there and as always Wikipedia will cover this sort of stuff um, so the five failure modes that we are considering are tension slash compression uh, they're both pretty similar shear uh, torsion and buckling and buckling may be something you guys haven't quite encountered yet so I've got a little bit more detail on that but it's not particularly hard so tension and compression, we've either got two forces going towards each other or two coming away. So here's our um, section in compression and a section in tension. Uh, the stress is just simple stress. So stress equals force on area. And the material strength we need to consider when doing tension and compression is the ultimate tensile strength and the yield strength of the material. So doing basic tension and compression calculations should hopefully be no drama for you guys. Uh, the next one is shear. Same equation again is used. Um, we've got here um, some shear force diagrams for some different beams down the bottom here. And what you need to work out is whether you're dealing with single shear or double shear. If you are dealing with say a case similar to this uh, where you've just got a bolt and two plates pulling on it, it is a single shear and the area you consider is just the cross-sectional area of this say bolt here. Um, this is also the type of shear, shear you would generally use for a simply supported beam if you're doing analysis on that. And the other kind of shear is double shear, which we have a diagram for here. So three plates and effectively we are trying to shear through on this bolt two lots of cross-sectional area. So the area we consider is this first area plus this second area so for our equation we would have stress equals F on 2A if 1A is just one cross-sectional area. Um, other thing to consider here is uh, the material strength we're dealing with with shear so the shear yield strength is different to our just typical yield strength and for steels it's typically about 0.58 times the yield strength. Um, this number changes for different uh, materials so whether you're dealing with aluminium, brass, titanium, magnesium you know uh, these numbers will change but you should be able to look these up um, either in books or just on the internet and in exam if needed uh, we should hopefully give them to you. Bending 
so slightly more complicated here. Uh, so our equation is stress equals my on i, where we have the bending stress, we have the calculated bending moment, so this is where using our bending moment diagram comes in handy and being able to derive those bending moments. Uh, we have y which is the vertical distance away from the neutral axis and i which is the moment of inertia of our section. So you can see here on these diagrams how we have a stress distribution coming across um, our section. So this is where our y term, the vertical distance away from the neutral axis, comes into play. So the further away you are from that neutral axis, the greater the stress in the beam is. Just one thing, other thing to consider, if you've got a beam that is bending with this sort of U shape to it, the top half of the beam will be in compression and the bottom half will be in tension. So this is, becomes important if you're dealing with a material, say, concrete, where it is very strong in compression but quite weak in tension. Uh, just going to go and have a quick look at moments of inertia. So it shouldn't be too hard. We should uh, be giving you guys formulas only dealing with simple sections, so no complicated moments of inertia to work out. So for rectangular sections, for example, it's the breadth times the height cubed divided by 12. And for a hollow circular section, you've got pi on 64, the outer diameter to the power of 4 minus the inner diameter to the power of 4. Uh, just another thing to note on this page here is this term here which we're going to be needing when we come to buckling. So this is the radius of gyration of um, the section. So that's just something to uh, keep in mind when we get to buckling in a couple of slides time. Other term to keep in mind is this term J, the polar moment of inertia. Uh, this is used in our next slide where we look at torsional stresses. So torsion, what we're dealing with here in torsion is shear stresses, so we've got shear stress symbol, and that is equal to the torque times the radius at which we're looking at divided by the polar moment of inertia. So similar to bending, the further, further you are away from the center point, uh, the greater the stress is. So we've got on a diagram here, we've got a um, hollow tube and so in this first section there is no stress because there's no material and then we hit this first diameter and we have these stresses here and then as we come further out the stress increases. Um, so once again we're dealing with shear stress so once again 0.58 times a year's stress approximately if we're dealing with steel and this one here, I'm definitely sure there's extra reference for it if you need it at their engineering toolbox. And just another equation to be aware of is the deflection of a section when we're dealing with torsion. So term theta is the number of degrees or radians that uh, we have deflecting and then it is dependent on the length of the section, torque that is applied the polar moment of inertia and the shear modulus. So final thing we've look, got to look at is buckling. So this may be a bit new to people so try step through it a bit more carefully. So when we apply say a compressive force to a section um, it may not necessarily fail due to its yield strength first. It may buckle and fail much at a much um, lower force than what we might expect for the compressive stress. That force is given by P critical which is equal to pi squared times Young's modulus or elastic modulus times the moment of inertia. 
divided by KL all squared, where KL is the effective length of the uh, column we are looking at, uh, and can also sometimes be denoted by LE. And so in this little picture over here, have some of the theoretical K values or effective lengths for different situations. If we have this situation here where the column is fixed into two ends of say, let's say concrete and you're dealing with a concrete column, the effective length will be 0 0.5. Um, if we have one end that's fixed and the other end is in a pin, the length we're dealing with is 0 0.7. And then we have some other lengths. So two pins, the effective length is one. Uh, only one end is fixed. Effective length we're looking at is two. So another way of looking at it is with this uh, critical stress term, which is derived simply from our force critical term where we have now force on area so giving that stress and we've just converted our I term into the A times radius of gyration squared so move the A over here radius of gyration is now on the bottom with our effective length term. Now another equation for buckling is the Johnson equation um, now this is similar to the Euler equation, so we've got an effective length term. The only difference is this is an actual, this term is actually plotted as a parabola and to determine our critical stress we have to take into consideration the material yield stress. So once again not too hard to actually use and get numbers for. Now complication arises when you need to consider whether you're using Euler or Johnson buckling equations and to do this we use what is called the slenderness ratio which is the effective length divided by the radius of gyration. So on the right here we have a plot of both the Johnson and Euler curves for two different materials so we have one material here another material here and the point where these two curves are tangent is given by a certain point s critical and uh, slenderness ratio where the particular critical length and slenderness ratio for a specific material is given by uh, the yield strength divided by two and the slenderness ratio given by this term here. And then depending on what the slenderness ratio is for the column we're looking at, if it is less than what we have calculated on this right hand side here, then we know we have to use the Johnson parabola to calculate um, our buckling. And if it is greater than this point, than this um, right hand side term there, then we can use the Euler buckling equation. So that concludes this intro video guys. Um, next couple of videos we'll just look at some really quick examples of how to use some of these equations.